Well, as uh, Sam mentioned, uh, this is uh, um, an advanced topics webinar by the BitCurator Consortium. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit more about how uh, some of the advanced features that we're using for bulk extractor and get into a little bit more in depth about what some of those advanced features are and how you could potentially use them to deal with your foreign digital collections. So I'm Michael Olson and uh, I'm the service manager for our Born Digital Forensics Lab. And Sandy, do you want to just briefly introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Sandy Ortiz and I'm the uh, Digital Forensics Lab Assistant here at Stanford University. Great. I'm going to spend uh, just a few minutes, uh, kind of the beginning of the presentation, providing a bit of context. And then I'm going to turn it over to Sandy, who's going to go into a little bit more detail about some of the advanced features. So, uh, so thanks for joining. Um, so some of the things that we're going to cover in today's webinar, uh, I'm going to very briefly kind of go over a brief overview of bulk extractor. Um, I'm sure most folks are at least um, personally familiar with some of, um, some of the features of what bulk extractor is in, intended to do. Uh, then I'm going to provide a little bit of context for uh, how or why we're interested in using it here at Stanford. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about the software itself. Uh, and then I'm going to actually turn it over to Sandy, who's going to address some of the advanced features, um, actually define what they are. Um, she's going to talk a little bit about the requirements to run, uh, some configuration uh, information and data. Um, some sample runs and the results of those sample runs. And then at the very end, we're going to open it up for discussion and questions. So what is Bulk Extractor? Um, bulk Extractor is a, a powerful analysis software tool uh, that allows us to identify potentially sensitive information such as social security numbers, credit card data, and other types of potentially sensitive information uh, in foreign digital collections. Um, it's important to note that it was developed for forensic investigations. Um, and uh, this is actually really important for uh, digital archivists and librarians to, to, to understand uh, when they start to look at the tool. Um, and uh, particularly when we start to talk a little bit more about the advanced features and how they're actually, um, how they're actually uh, built out in the application and more importantly, how they're actually used together. Um, bulk extractor, it scans a disk image, a file, or a directory of files to extract information uh, from said data. And uh, one of the useful outcomes of this is it generates uh, histograms uh, of different features uh, that would be useful in doing analysis and processing of a board digital collection. Uh, now, the larger question that I think is important because it's going to really impact how um, how we've approached using it here at Stanford is kind of our institutional context. Um, it's important to note that we're not actually using bulk extractor in production yet. Um, we're uh, actively testing it and um, trying to figure out exactly how we want to apply the, app, the uh, bulk extractor application in our production workflows. Um, we're really interested in having uh, bulk extractor automatically scan all of our collections to create histograms that can be used by a digital archivist to evaluate whether a board digital archive, uh, archive has uh, personal identifying information um, or sensitive data uh, in our collections. Um, and finally, we're, we're planning on using bulk extractor to provide more uh, in-depth analysis of types of data that are contained in board digital collections. So for example, a collection that contains a large uh, volume of word processed or textual files um, after running it through Bulk Extractor may provide a digital archivist with further ideas on how they might want to tune Bulk Extractor application to look for collection specific features. And this applies to not only collections of textual data, but any sort of type of more digital collection. Um, there's a fair bit of variation in the different MIME types file systems, file structures, document types that one would find. Um, and uh, there's, uh, based on that data, one would essentially uh, do some tuning to bulk extractor to provide additional data about what's in the collection and how you might process it. Um, part of the context for how we're really um, 
that's that's sort of focused how we're approaching bulk extractor here at Stanford is um, we've become very sensitive to security concerns. So what you're looking at here is um, uh, an example of the data risk classifications. And what we're particularly interested in using bulk extractor for is defining, uh, as you can see there, the high risk bucket of data. Uh, and that's things like health insurance policy numbers, social security numbers, financial data, uh, anything that could potentially, uh, uh, if it got out in the wild, uh, provide, uh, damage the reputation of the, of the university. And um, what's interesting is that these different buckets of data actually map to something like this. And uh, this is kind of a list of approved services. And so this, these are things that um, applications and systems that one that are approved to work with these different types of data. Um, so for example, um, if you look at, if you look at the first, uh, the very first bullet here, we could essentially put high risk data in an, uh, any sort of Zoom conference that we're doing at Stanford. Um, not that you would necessarily want to do that, but that's just an example. Whereas, for example, <laughs> if you look at number three, it's, it's our Office 365 calendar. We're not supposed to put our social security number in our calendar. Um, that's probably not the best example, but um, if you were to scroll down further, you would actually see lists of different sorts of file storage or systems that are either approved or not approved for handling that data. Um, so the point of showing you this is that this is, this is kind of the institutional context of how we want to um, use bulk extractor and some of the advanced features to kind of define what falls into particular buckets. Uh, I'm now going to talk a little bit more about the bulk extractor software. Um, one thing that may not be initially apparent um, to users in the Big Curator environment is that bulk extractor is an independent piece of software that is still under development. Uh, in other words, it's an earlier version of Big Curator is likely to implement an earlier version of bulk extractor. Um, the current Big Curator release of 1.8.16 um, uses version 1.6.0 dev of bulk extractor. Um, I'm not going to go into all the different release notes for this latest version, um, but I think it's important to leave you with the fact that there's incremental improvements to how this particular scanners work and improvements to the bulk extractor viewer. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the latest release of bulk extractor, um, we've got a couple pages of references at the end of this presentation. Um, and one of them is to the, uh, the GitHub release notes for 1.6. And it's, it's interesting also to look at, um, there's a little bit of a, uh, an inkling of a roadmap for what future improvements or, and or work, um, is, is, uh, slated to be done on the, uh, bulk extractor, uh, software in the future. Um, I, I just wanted to just familiarize folks with the, this is the bulk, ex, the bulk extractor viewer interface. Um, you can actually do everything that you want to do from the command line, but I think it's important to just point this out as a visual reference for what some of the different, um, how the application actually works. Uh, you can see at the top is where you would specify uh, the target uh, for your data set, whether that's a disk image or a directory of files. And then there's uh, some general options box just below that where you would essentially um, uh, indicate to use like stop lists or banner files or alert lists. Um, and uh, just underneath that is some tuning parameters if you wanted to actually tune how the application was, was running its scans. Um, and off to the right, you'll actually see here is your list of scanners, um, uh, quite an extensive list of, of different types of scanners. And Sandy's going to talk a little bit more about that when we go forward. So um, just before I hand it over to Sandy, um, I, I want to kind of talk a little bit about uh, how we actually came up with the list of the features that we were interested in showing and talking about in this webinar. As I mentioned before, we're not currently using in production, um, but um, we didn't start off that way. We actually started um, 
do some, some analysis by actually throwing real world collections using bulk extractor. Um, as we were going down, um, down that path, we actually had a fair bit of, um, it was a bit of a learning curve, um, particularly when we realized that um, not necessarily working with collections that were known data sets created some issues. So in other words, we would run it against a collection and come out and it's like, was that really the results that we wanted? Is that really what's in this? Um, so there, there actually is some value when you're starting to use the advanced features for, uh, for starting out using uh, data sets that are more known. Um, um, that was one of our findings that we hope is actually useful for, for folks that are thinking of using some of these advanced features um, going forward. Um, another important note is that some of our collections are actually quite large. So uh, there are definite implications when you're figuring out how you want to actually apply um, different advanced features uh, towards collections. Um, so even though it's designed to be a very efficient application, um, how, you're, how you select certain advanced features and how they work in combination uh, is not a trivial, uh, does not take a trivial amount of processing time. It's actually can be quite, quite extensive on the machine that you're, that you're running it on. Uh, and Sandy's gonna talk a little bit more about that um, in the further slides. And finally, the context for this is, I, I thought I've, as we've sort of been preparing for this webinar and, and ex exploring how we wanted to use advanced features here at Stanford, I've kind of felt like the Cheshire cat, um, uh, sort of pointing Sandy towards the uh, either a set of uh, of doors or uh, interesting paths for her to explore, and uh, thanks Sandy for being uh, <laughs> being so accommodating um, as as we've been going forward uh, to try new di new and different things, uh, different features, and that sort of thing. It's been a, a definite um, an exciting learning experience. So Sandy, uh, would you mind taking over from here? Okay, great. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to thank Michael and Sam for inviting me uh, to be part of this project. And I'm going to move pretty quickly here through these slides. And I've got a lot of information to talk about. And I'm going to try not to get too technical. But, um, you know, this is my uh, first pass using uh, bulk extractor. So a lot of this was exploratory for me. And uh, you know, what I hope to do today is to, um, is to give you some definitions of um, some of the general options that are available in that screenshot that Michael showed earlier. Because one of the first things I had to do in approaching this tool was to say, well, you know, what is a stop list? What is a word list? What is an alert list? what is this find regex text and, and how do they all work together? How are they different? And then, you know, then you have to get to the piece of configuring those to make them run and give you relevant data. So I'm going to quickly run through some definitions of that. And then I want to define some of the requirements because there's technical requirements that you need to have depending on which general option you're selecting to run, and then uh, I'll take you through a, a sample run configuration. I actually did run through um, three different runs with several different data sets, and I just picked one out um, for the sake of brevity to, to show you some screenshots and explain what the results were so that we can have a little bit of discussion about that. So um, with that, uh, the definitions um, I just took right out of the bulk extractor manual and this was just for my references I was starting with the tool you know and essentially um, the stop list is, is really kind of a white list you know within your institutional context if you've determined that there's data that doesn't need to be processed um, you can kind of create a stop list to tell your scanners to ignore that data. Um, so it's really helpful also to use that in combination with um, an alert list if you have a list of terms that you want to be able to treat in a very customized way or take uh, further analysis of 
then an alert list functions as kind of a red list. And um, then you'll see right in the middle there, uh, the word list is kind of something used for password cracking. Um, and, and again, this goes to the original intent of, um, you know, the forensics uh, applications that, that this tool was designed to use, generally in a law enforcement context. So they might be, you know, interested in getting into somebody's hard drive or phone, and that's where um, having the tool scan and create a word list of every known word on the device would be helpful to feed into a password cracking program. Um, and then finally, the one that I focused the most on was the find regex text file. Um, and that's one of the general options in that um, bulk extractors uh, general options list. And what I did is I took um, a custom lexicon file from the EPAD project here at Stanford and I reformatted it and I fed it into that that particular scanner engine and let it work with the other scanners and um, that had some interesting results. So it was um, quite a bit of work to actually put all those pieces together, but uh, I eventually did get it and get some results. So, you know, there's some specific requirements that you need in order to be able to uh, run these general options with the scanners and here, on the left, you can see the configuration for bulk extractor. What I did is I had all the default bulk extractor scanners selected. And then under the general option, um, I selected the option to use the find regular expression text file, um, or you can choose the alert list there in that section. And What's significant to understand about that is that you need to have that file properly formatted in a way that bulk extractor can use it. So you can use, I used the same uh, lexicon file uh, for both the regex text file and alert list scan that I tested. And one of the other things that I discovered is for the processing, um, bulk extractor could only process the EO1 AFF or the raw image formats. And now again, I'm new, but that's what I uh, kind of determined from my research and using the tool um, because my initial approaches to the tool was were using the uh, AD1 format from uh, which is a custom format from FTK Imager. And so that threw some roadblocks for me and I, I eventually found some uh, sample images online to, to use for that. And, and that sample image reference is uh, actually in the references section. Then on the custom lexicon file, the way that I had to format it is I, I had to put one term per line and I had to make sure that each line ended in a new line. And um, when I ran it, um, I didn't make any customizations regarding case sensitivity. Uh, I just used all lowercase, I believe, were most of the terms in the file. But that is something that needs to be paid attention to is that the tool is case sensitive. So if you have social security in only lowercase letters, then it's only going to identify those terms that match that case which you know is probably not something you want to do. You probably want to account for all of that uh, case sensitivity when you're scanning a drive. So here's the hardware configuration. I did run this on a, a quad core laptop and uh, I had 16 gigs of RAM um, winning, running Windows 7 64 bit. And I actually ran it within a virtual, a guest virtual machine. And I think this is significant because the configuration of my virtual machine, um, although the hard drive was 32 gigabytes, which was adequate to for some of the collections that I was processing, it was really the, the memory space and the guest swap file space, I think that's probably really important if I were to try and scan uh, a larger size collection. The image file that I was using was only, I think, 500, over 500 megabytes. But some of those image files can get fairly large, and that's where 
paying attention to the size of your memory space and your swap file size is going to matter because bulk extractor is designed to be a multi-threaded application and it will maximize itself with the number of cores and the number of threads that are available on those cores and it will use all available memory and swap file space so you know configuring the hardware to kind of maximize the efficiency of the program um, is a real important consideration um, and i was writing this data to an external usb3 hard drive um, that was encrypted with vericrypt so you know there there were a lot of moving hardware parts here and um, i don't want to get off into the rest of that but um, those were all of the considerations that I had to be aware of um, as I was toying and monkeying with, well, how big is the image that I'm using? Well, how much hardware am I throwing at it? You know, how much throughput am I going to get with USB 3? Where is it going to hang up? So these were a lot of the questions that that were running through my mind as I was I was approaching this. So here you can see the um, the sample uh, command line structures that I that I commands that I input um, and this is all specific to my particular configuration because you can see here the output destination path uh, it says media vericrypt and that's my local virtual machine path and then the NTFS uh, practice 2017 is the directory uh, that that the image was sitting in um, but in this case this is the output directory that I I used was find NTFS uh, practice 2017 you can see that there because I ran several different uh, images or, or scanners against this image so I would create different output directories they would be find they would be alert you know they would be um, whatever tool I was working with and they would be subdirectories within the NTFS uh, practice 2017 directory so so then on the command line you can choose the option um, switch uppercase F and um, you give it the location and the path of that custom lexicon file that you want to use for your regular expression or um, or alert list and you can see here I used the EPAD has a faculty lexicon and that's the one that I used it, it was a I think it was a 42 term lexicon and I chose that for its brevity because there was a, a sensitive lexicon that had over 850 terms and I wasn't quite sure how long it would take to process that but um, that's that's why I chose the smaller the smaller file to work with and then of course then you finally want to input the source uh, that it's supposed to to scan on so here you can see I use the NTFS uh, practice 2017 uh, EO1 image file so um, next let's see this is kind of the meat of what I found um, and and it's pretty significant and the uh, find, and this is how the find scanner versus the light grip scanner works. And how bulk extractor is set up is there the newer version, and I'm not quite sure which version this changed in, but the newer version includes a scanner called light grip. And it's a significant step up in terms of processing efficiency from the find scanner. And I've I've noted here and given you you know a description of how those efficiencies work and essentially the light grip scanner what it does is it takes that group of terms that's in that custom lexicon file and then it grabs a processing chunk from the disk and it looks for all those terms in that processing chunk and then it just goes through the disk chunk by chunk looking for terms whereas the find scanner is much less efficient and it will take one term and it will go through the entire disk image to look for that one term then it'll take the next term and it'll go through the entire disk image to look for that term so you can imagine if you have an 853 
term lexicon file that you would go over a single disk disk image 853 times and that's not very efficient so you know figuring out whether or not the light grip scanner was working or running was my most important focus here because i'm like well i want to use the most important engine here so i've included some links to some uh further detail um on the light grip scanner and um also want to note that the scanners work in conjunction with the custom general options that you use. So if I am giving bulk extractor the custom lexicon file and I'm using that find regex option to point to that custom lexicon file and I'm saying go out to the disk and find all of these terms, it's going to work in conjunction with the scanners that I've selected um, on that image file that Michael showed you of the bulk extractor uh, image. Uh, it, it, um, it gives you that list of scanners. And so I created a slide here to show you there are differences in the scanners between the bulk extractor versions. So if you're thinking of running this and you want to run the light grip scanner, you need to make sure that you have the 1.6 dash dev bulk extractor version because that's what I was running and that's what had the light grip scanner. So I included this screenshot to show you um, that on the previous screenshot, those scanners were actually missing and, and that's on the right. And then on the left, you can see where they're included. This screenshot is, is from my installation and it shows some additional scanners that can also be used um, that I won't get off into the detail about what those are, but um, essentially making sure that the light grip scanner is installed means that uh, bulk extractor will use the light grip scanner or, or engine um, instead of the fine scanner, which is, which is what you want. Um, so here's the results um, or the start of the scanning that I did. And one of the things I was concerned about was, you know, how am I gonna know if my CPU is overheating or my CPU is, uh, is, is maxed out? Is it gonna hang? You know, am I gonna run into problems? I, I had to keep an eye on what was going on with my hardware. And so I installed a program called Open Hardware Monitor. And as you can see here, I was closely paying attention to my temperatures and how much of a load my CPU was running at and um, you know how, how much further I thought that the process could go and making sure that, that, that it wasn't getting hung up or overheating anywhere. Um, so here at the finish of the run, um, it only took 12 minutes to run through the hard drive, but it was really confusing because it says that it only processed 272 megabytes of 524 megabyte source image. So I'm not quite sure what happened there. Um, didn't have a chance to go back and kind of examine those results and see why that happened, what it was processing, what it wasn't. But um, I wanted to present that and uh, let you know that that was the first thing that I looked at. You know, this was the feedback that the bulk extractor run gave me um, by running those default scanners against the faculty lexicon using that uh, use find regular expression option within bulk extractor. So I also ran an alert feature file scan and it only returned one term using that same faculty lexicon. And again, I didn't have an opportunity to explore that and understand why that happened. Um, and I believe it is context sensitive, but uh, I need to spend some more time understanding uh, why, that, why that happened and understanding how that, that particular piece of, of the tool works. So here um, are the results between the find and the light grep uh, tool um, engine, if you will. 
And what you can see here is that um, the term service uh, actually had two different results. And one more time, I didn't have an opportunity to spend time figuring out why that did. Um, my first initial question was, you know, it, it was, were these engines treating the encoding differently? Um, were these terms located within the disk image? Were they encoded um, UTF-8 or UTF-16 or some other format that, that, you know, caused it to treat it differently and count it or not count it? That was a little bit more time, would require a little bit more time than I had for this project. Um, so, so with that, I just want to turn it back over to Sam and Michael and uh, open it up for questions. And, uh, you know, hopefully I didn't overwhelm you with technical information, but uh, it was quite technical what I was trying to do. So um, I, I hope that, that this was useful for you. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, uh, Sandy and Michael. That that was really helpful. Um, I hope I hope for the people on the call, especially those um, that maybe are uh, just getting started with bulk extractor, or maybe use it a couple times. That maybe it was a little more a deeper bit of information. I, I thought it was particularly uh, helpful, Sandy, to to your um, decision to be monitoring hardware while the tool is running. Um, I think for you know, either for virtual uh, setups or even those folks that are running it on, you know, a, a dedicated um, Ubuntu Linux install, um, you know, especially for probably larger, larger data sets, being able to get some sort of window into what's happening with the hardware while the tool is processing will probably, you know, provide some useful benchmarks um, going forward. So that for me was particularly uh, useful, helpful, but enough about me. Um, let's open it up for, for questions from, from other folks, um, either for, for Sandy or Michael in terms of what, what they just went over. Anybody got anything burning either in the chat or just on your mics? <clears throat> Uh, hey, this is Walker. Oh, somebody typed in as well. Go, go for it, Walker. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask, um, Michael, you, you had mentioned um, kind of trying to track or um, organize a bulk extractor outputs to your existing security IT um, sort of security classifications yes uh, um we've got something similar here and i was just curious if if you all have worked directly with with your it on this to see if uh what they think of um bulk extractor as a tool that could align outputs to to those uh categories or um if uh, anybody from from the it team has sort of uh, given their take on the on the bulk extractor tool in general. Uh, is my mic on? Can everyone hear me? Yep. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. No, that's a really good question, uh, Walker. Um, actually, what's interesting is is we've actually got a <clears throat> there's an effort at Stanford right now where they've created a tiger team um, at the Internet Security Office of which I've joined. Um, and we have just started those discussions of whether or not bulk extractor is a tool that, that could potentially be used. Um, I think one of the, uh, one of the interesting, um, one of the really interesting things that I've come across and I was tempted to actually put in a slide of, to this effect was um, what our, um, our ISO office is currently using is identity finder. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really struck actually using that particular piece of software versus using bulk extractor, um, just how customizable bulk extractor is uh, and how flexible. 
And that's really useful in some respects. Um, it's also a, a real challenge as well, um, as we've uncovered with some of these runs that Sandy has been, has been doing for us. Um, just the, the number of features and customizable um, and inter, inter how the different features work together uh, makes it a bit of a challenge. Um, so what I, I, I'm actually fairly hopeful, but once again, I, I really think that we need to get a better grab, better, better understanding of some of these rabbit holes um, and what's causing them and actually a little bit more figure out how the tool is, is actually generating the results that it is before we can make that step. Yeah, and, um, th th this, is, this is Cali at UNC. I just wanted to point out, we had similar experience at UNC. We also use Identity Finder. Um, and I think one of the things is the question of whether the institution uh, values consistency over efficiency, right? Because running bulk extractor against files just anecdotally on my own machine, because I also had to write Identity Finder, it was both more effective and profoundly faster. But part of that was because the way Identity Finder has been rolled out in our university allows us to not change any of the options. They want it to be consistently run on everybody's machines, right? And so, you know, it could very well be that some institutions simply don't want that kind of flexibility when it comes to running across all the machines in their in their enterprise because they want it to just they, they want to have a reportable result that they know was run with the exact same configuration. Um, so essentially, like if all the options are grayed out to you in Identi Identity Finder and it just runs the defaults, it's incredibly inefficient. But that's kind of what a lot of institutions probably want. So I'll just throw out Tim's question there, unless Tim, you want to shout it out, or maybe you're not able to in your current audio situation. Um, but Tim's question was about, um, you know, recognizing that you guys aren't using it in production, but just any sort of uh, plans for um, what will happen um, when you do identify some PIIs, or what may, what are some next steps? in your, your workflow or your process or what you're considering as next steps? Yeah, I, I think we need to, um, we actually need to figure out, um, we need to present some of these, uh, some of these results with known collections to our digital archivists and our head of manuscripts um, and actually verify that, you know, these are things that they really wanna know and the level of detail is appropriate. Um, as, as you can see, when you actually look at some of the results, they can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, so we want to verify that first. And number one, you know, is there certain configurations that we're running uh, a certain um, alerts and or um, uh, scanners that, that, that are more useful than others that we would want to run against a bulk, uh, a bulk number of collections. Um, my particular goal in this is to actually generate audit reports once we figure out what these basic sets of scans that we want to run would be to have it actually um, run against everything and generate audit reports um, it's another question that we haven't talked about yet um, is what do you do when you get all these results um, ultimately you know there's there's got to be some sort of uh, human process to be able to do an evaluation uh, of what those results are but I still think there's really value in being able to um, come up with a, a set of scans that you would want to run against everything um, and then have have that that audit trail uh, in existence there's value in that um, so I hope that answers your question other uh, questions or feedback or responses? So one other, one other just to, to kind of circle back to that, that question, um, one of the things that at least my goal is to get away from is to, um, we're a little bit piecemeal on how we're running these scans right now. And I think that's why um, I actually am hopeful that we'll be able to create kind of some default configurations and scans that we run against everything uh, rather than having to 
turn our digital archivist loose? Did he scan this? Did he not scan that? Um, want to kind of get away from that and try to use some automated processes to, to leverage the, um, the flexibility of the tool, but also to, to get some of the manual um, efforts out, out, of the, out of the loop, if, if at all possible. Because uh, I, I can see great value in scripting it and just everything that's loaded on a particular uh, file store would be automatically scanned in the background. Uh, that would be really, really useful. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess I have a question for, for those on the call. Um, it'd, be, it'd be interesting to hear just, just for dis discussion purposes, if anybody else has already um, either experimented with using you know, alert lists um, or the stop lists or even some regular expression formations. Um, and if, you know, even if you've just done any trial cases, if you run into some of the same issues that Sandy did, or if, you know, any, I guess anything to add on, on other, other experiences in this regard. And maybe you're on this call because you haven't, uh, this webinar because you haven't done that, but just, just curious to hear if anybody's had and anything they'd like to, to share on their experience. Ah, so Tim puts in the chat, maybe you'll see those he's used rather regular expressions to find Canadian social insurance numbers. And Tim, was that because the default, yeah, the default scanner was just looking for the um, US based, uh, what, syntax for social security numbers? Right. Interesting. Some default sort of parameters right right different numbers in different places mm -hmm. you know i actually had a question for tim um i as part of this whole process i actually installed and ran tim walsh's cca tools um just as an exercise and i was interested in uh figuring out how to plug in the custom regex usage, the custom lexicon with the CCA tools. Have have you done that, Tim? Do you do you do that? I'll give a chance attempt. Oh, he said. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, because I um, do you think it would be possible to do that? I haven't explored, but I'm. I'm not opposed to figuring it out. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in looking at that and, and figuring out how to do that because making those custom lexicons a part of that, that default scan in CCA tools would be really, really kind of cool. Adding some extra command line options, right. Right, finding the right place to stick that in. Yep, thanks, Tim. Awesome. Cool. Goal. Okay. New project idea spinning up. Goal webinar reached. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is this many other goals were, were reached as well. Um, but other other thoughts, questions, feedback, <clears throat> harebrained ideas. Did anybody learn anything new? You can just raise your hand. You can do the use the yes, no. Um, people raise some hands. Walker raises his hand. I actually have one more question, Sam. This is Shira. Yes, um, go for it. So uh, I know that in the past, um, you guys over at Stanford have used um, FTK in your workflows there. And I don't know if that's still kind of, um, you know, one of the main how prominently that fi that factors into your workflows currently. But I'm wondering um, if you guys have any thoughts about um, either kind of bulk extractor versus FTK, maybe advantages you see. You already talked about some of the advantages over 
um, identity finder in particular. But I guess um, if you just if if you have any thoughts about how you might use this um, instead of in tandem with um, et cetera, FTK that is. Yeah, this is this is Michael. That's a really good question, Shira. Um, I, I I think one of the things that we've actually discovered uh, when Sandy and I were really trying to kind of run this against real world collections is we realized that we have not been as consistent as perhaps we should have been on what tools we used and what um, what types of disk images we've been generating, uh, which is a little bit concerning. Um, particularly when we ran into the issue with the 81. Um, I, I think that that's one thing that, um, that's one of, one of, we recently are, we're in the process of hiring a new digital archivist to kind of help Peter Chan out. And I think one of the hopes that we have is that we can actually systematize the tools we're using and how we're using them um, and document that a lot better. Um, just because there are inconsistencies that, that, that crop up depending on what tool you're using. Um, I mean, FDK Imager, um, I, I understand why, why some folks really like it, and it's just, but it's just one more tool in the toolbox. And if you're gonna use any sort of tool, you need to document what you're using it and, and what your outputs are, because you might have to go back at some point. One would hope not, but these inconsistencies with the 81s that we've been generating are, are concerning. So um, I hope that's useful. Um, yeah, definitely. Thanks. So in other words, don't do what we did. <laughs> Lessons learned. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? <clears throat> Discussion ideas? Um, I've, I've got one, Sam, uh, that kind of came out of this, um, um, sort of out of this, this investigation kind of work that, that Sandy in particular and I have been working on. Um, I, I think that there's definitely a greater need out there for, um, and, and maybe this is al already happening and we're just not plugged into the right channel, but um, you know, whether it's a, a kind of a working group or a group of people that, that are really um, kind of running, um, are discussing sort of these outputs and these issues that come out, these little rabbit holes and inconsistencies. Um, I think um, there's, it would be useful to have more than just one institution kind of exploring and playing with those sorts of things. Um, I know everyone's super busy, but it's just an idea that, that's kind of popped up um, based on what happened. No, that's a that's a great a great point, Michael. And I, I think getting to Tim's first question about sort of you know when you find PII, then then what do you do? I mean, I, th I think that's also just you know what when you find these these questions that come up in the results, what are what are the the next steps um, in, in terms of um, you know for either further investigations or making a decision around the resources needed for that additional investigation. So making a sort of cost benefit analysis. Um, <clears throat> I think that's a topic that would be really worthwhile um, for a working group, um, you know, either within the BCC or in collaboration with other groups. Um, uh, yeah, it'd be great to, to, you know, maybe bring this to a monthly call as a, as a topic. I think um, we could sort of extend that um, into that forum um, to see what others, others might have insights about, um, you know, or just, you know, find a way to start, you know, figuring out a way to sort of share some of these, these outputs in a way that people are comfortable with to maybe get some other eyes on them uh, or at least just sort of, start to characterize some of these scenarios. So um, yeah, I think it's a great idea. Maybe if there's others that are interested, we could, again, sort of think about bringing this at least to a monthly call to at least continue the discussion. <clears throat> I, I had a question. I am, um, you know, in, in going through all of this with Michael and, and 
raising the topic of well when you create a disk image would you know what how do you choose which format to use um on the faqs on the bit curator website i noticed that there was a mention that the advanced forensics format had an issue with uh, ntfs partitioned and partitions and scanning them and, and there were known issues with that and i don't know how current that information was and i wanted to know if there was any resources that somebody could point me to that maybe had some more current information um, regarding um, the advanced forensics format and bulk extractor um. So this is, this is Cal again. Essentially, AFF, which was um, first initiated by Simpson Garfinkel and then picked up by some colleagues um, uh, several years ago, was essentially just abandoned very publicly. Simpson Garfinkel made a statement that people should, it should be deprecated and people shouldn't use it anymore because uh, the notion was that he, um, the expert witness format had been reverse engineered and there was free software out there to parse it and deal with it. Um, so essentially, the you know, any future trajectory of hoping that things get addressed with AFF that haven't already been addressed are essentially in the AFF4 initiative, which is still ongoing, um, which is to essentially have this next generation AFF format. Um, the future of it is still a bit uncertain. They regularly report on it at the research conferences, but, um, you know, um, it was kind of a painful uh, tr process for us because for a lot of philosophical reasons, we wanted to advocate for AFF when we were off teaching people about these things. But um, when essentially the people behind the primary open source tools that we rely on decide that they're just not going to support it anymore, um, we really didn't have much choice but to essentially let people know that probably either raw or expert witness format was the right choice. Um, it doesn't mean that anybody who chose AFF is in such a terrible position because you could always either convert that AFF given the available libraries either to expert witness format or to raw. Um, but essentially, it's kind of a lost cause to hope for additional um, efforts to address existing limitations of AFF itself because it's not being actively developed. Okay, thank you. So at this point, we got just a few minutes left. Um, so I guess I'll just make another call for for any any last questions for for Sandy or Michael before we close, or for anybody else, I guess. Okay. Well, uh, then please uh, join me and again in, in thanking Michael and Sandy for what clearly uh, is you know taken a, a good a good amount of effort to um, both conduct these investigations and then put together a really excellent uh, overview um, and, and set of topics. Um, I think a lot of people are, are exploring these issues. Uh, maybe you guys are just a little further along. So um, if this helps spur uh, other folks uh, maybe to, to, to take take the dive themselves, then I think I think that's a, a super super outcome. Um, and yeah, I'm going to pick up these ideas around continuing discussion um, on next steps and uh, we'll take things from there. So uh, thanks again to everybody um, and hope everybody has uh, a nice weekend. Thanks everyone. Great. Thank you. Take care all.